esoteric subjects that uh, are very important but very few people uh, study, and those include uh, ethics, education, educational teaching, techniques for it, things that work, things that don't. And uh, today he's going to try to take us through uh, what we ought to be learning from a standpoint of uh, uh, educational teaching for attendings that will count for us with the university uh, as, um, you know, mentoring uh, <clears throat> and faculty development. And, but it also is going to be very important to you as teachers as you come up through there. So I would pay all of us uh, would have a great uh, time today listening to Dr. Stanley, try to figure out what his take-home messages are, and talk to him afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, so this is, this is going to be focused on uh, you all residents as teachers. Do we have medical students in here also? Yeah, so... Um, Anyway, I, I think um, the way I'm going to do, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sort of the nuts and some of the nuts and bolts things. But I hope what you really take home is the things that I believe really make a good teacher versus a great teacher, and it has more to do with uh, the example that you set as as a physician. And uh, so I guess that would be the the goal of this particular talk today. Um, the first, the good teacher wants to be a good teacher, and it, it does have its own rewards. Um, you know, I've enjoyed teaching you guys. I, I like having somebody in the operating room. It's not always the easiest thing for either of us, I think. Uh, but I think when I go home at the end of the day, I think that that's one of the things that really makes my day worthwhile. And I think you guys have experienced that too. And so, first of all, we're just going to get some things out of the way as far as what exactly are the clerks, clerkships and the expectations, because I think you all need to know what they are. But as you know, they are now rotating not only on general A, trauma, and uh, vascular and uh, <clears throat> acute care, but also PEDS. There are, they started the PEDS and Orange service uh, just this last rotation. And has, has anybody, has that been going well with you all? Any problems? Yep. I think they, they've enjoyed it. Um, we actually have a large complement of students uh, this summer, especially with a lot of fourth-year students, so it's really been helpful for you all to have them on origin. I th it sounds like you all have been paying attention, but that, that is a problem that we've seen. It's hard for them to actually get beside the table. They do have the weekend calls and, and daily calls. Um, and then they have a lot of lectures, and that's been something that we've been talking about. And I'll kind of go through sort of the thoughts about that. And, of course, conferences, clinics, and skills labs. So they're doing a lot of things. As you know, they oftentimes just disappear. And, uh, and those are things that we know, we know where they are generally. I don't know of any student that we've had, uh, maybe one or two that likes to go home early, but, uh, but nobody that just runs out in the middle of the day that I'm aware of. Um, so as far as uh, the... Uh, lecture topics uh, was something that we based on the tests that they take, and that was something that we found out last year that they really wanted that done. And so we, that's the reason for changing. And I really appreciate you all helping uh, with those with those lectures, and for the faculty members that that do those. Um, so uh, it's not UT that does that; it's it's a national exam. So, um, and that's how we teach them. And the arrangements, uh, I'm going to just show this in a different manner, and this is how I'm going to show you how we've arranged them. So, there, yeah, there are a lot of lectures. Uh, we had some input from one of the residents saying that, that maybe we ought to consider, are we doing too many lectures? And um, I think, you know, the students are still coming from a standpoint that they're used to having lectures, they're used to learning it, and if they can get this basis of knowledge, then you, when you all are in the operating room, I think that really helps them understand what's going on. So that's the reason why we have so many lectures. But what we've tried to do we tried to bunch them up, and as you see, they ha have full days without lectures uh, uh, on rounds, how to present when you're sit sitting at uh, the coffee sh shop table, that sort of thing. And so they do go to our clinics. We have a number of faculty members who have them come to their clinics, um, myself, Dr. Mejia, Maxwell, Kuntz, Smith, and then, of course, the Orange Clinics are really important, and Dr. Vallier. And you all may be familiar with these cards. Um, these are things you can really help them with because the, this, these are requirements that they have, and these are requirements that they have um, 
system wide and they need to get all these things they need to have these different diagnoses they need to have uh, different um, procedures that they do and sometimes it's hard for them to get an in intubation or place a foley or na nasogastric tube so if you have if you're going to see a patient and you know they're going to need a nasogastric tube you know call your students hey let's let's go do a, an NG I'll show you how to put it down and I don't know um, who who regularly puts down nasogastric tubes okay not very many um, yeah so yeah so um, it's not infrequent that I'll put a nasogastric tube in uh, because I think in some ways we understand the anatomy a little bit better as far as the angle to go and to press medial and posterior. Sometimes the nurses really don't know that, and, and, um, and you can really help your patient by, by easily placing a nasogastric tube. It's something that we as physicians ought to do. It's not infrequent that I'll put one, put, put one down, uh, if, especially if the nurse is having trouble. And then, of course, they do the handwritten uh, notes. You'll be seeing them do notes, and I don't, I don't really necessarily think we need to go by justifying that. It's our system right now, and we're doing the best we can on that. Um, and so they do have the requirements for that, um, and they have different requirements. Holly, I'm not going to go in specifics on that unless does anybody want to go with specifics on that? Okay. Uh, the evaluation, this, is, this here is a very difficult thing, the e-medley. Um, we're having big problems. I don't completely understand the problems. Uh, I, all I have to say is, from your standpoint, we'll try to keep you up as far as how you do them. I think the main thing is, you know, we really do need them because um, I, I have to do a midterm and a final meeting with them, and if I don't have any data, it's really difficult, and, uh, and we have to get them in on time. So, so these are real important, and I appreciate you all doing them. And then... Um, the rotation lengths are different, uh, as you may know, and, and really the PA students are treated uh, most, like, um, most like the third-year medical students, and we, we really can, we include them just like we do, we do them. They don't do all the procedures um, that the medical students do, but they are right, right in there. And then also we are evaluated, um, and at the end of the rotations, the students, they have to complete the hall tacket and the GME evaluations, and we get that feedback, and that really helps us to understand some of the things that we've been talking about and some of the things that we've changed. So, um, so that, that's also where, um, um, where we, we get the feedback, and we kind of are courting our M4 students that, that want to be residents here, and I, and I think... I think that this is where they see whether or not we're, we have a culture that they want to be part of. And, and I think you all are very aware of that. So that's important. So in other words, we, we do need to be on our best behavior. And I hope it's because we're taking good care of patients and we care about the students. But if nothing else, it's because we're going to be evaluated. And there, you know, these are the people that were recognized this, this last, uh, of, the, of the residents that were recognized this last uh, year. And so, you know, the, these are people that actually took note, the students took note that these people were really paying attention to them. And, and there's some very good teachers in the room that are not on this list. But, but, um, but it's really nice to see them put a name of somebody who really took the time uh, to, to, to spend with them. And, um, and when I sit down at the end, you know, there's a few of these names in here that they just they consistently say, oh, yeah, that resident took the time. They always wanted me to be involved. And so you guys are doing a good, good job. And, uh, and, and the influence you have, uh, they'll remember that. I remember the names of some of my best uh, residents that taught me, um, you know, 30-something years ago. And so um, anyway, so congratulations to you guys. Uh, you, the student participation here is rated extremely high. We're the best uh, surgical program in the state um, and one of the best rotations of any specialty as far as the way that the students uh, give feedback on the way that you all are including them in what you do. And we had the dean come and talk to us about that, and they just said, we just want to know what you guys are doing. What are you doing right? And I said, well, you know, it's our residents. Uh, they, they take an interest in, in the students. They spend time with them. They do the things they need to do. So you guys are being excellent teachers uh, already. And uh, and also you all are participation, participating not only in, in creating those lectures, but in doing them and in the testing process. So uh, I, you guys are doing a, a great job on that. And uh, I think part of that is, and for the, the new interns, is part of it's because we do talk about this, and I think we make it a priority 
Now, obviously, when I talk to the students, they'll say, well, there's, there's a, a variety. There's some residents that are not, you know, as engaged as other residents. So I think, I think that we do have some room for improvement, but overall, you all do a very good job. So I'm proud of you for that. Um, and and uh, like I say, one of the main metrics that I think sets us apart is the team building. And, and this is, this, these are the sort of things that I want you to think about today and how you build a team. Uh, but in everything, just think about, it's not just me doing this, and you do have a lot of things on your list that you have to get done, but just think about, you know, we're a team that's helping each other. The students love it when you send them up to check on somebody. Hey, how's this person doing? Just go check their vital signs, come back and report to me what you think is going on. Let's say if you're doing an H&P &P and you get a call on somebody, maybe even if it's something you might not typically take care of on the phone, you might just send the student and say, hey, I want you to really go check this out, make sure they're okay. Check their pain level, find out why they're having pain. You know, why are they calling me for more pain medication? There's times that when I've been on call at nighttime and they just call me, oh, I just want some pain medicine. You start asking questions and you realize I've got to come in from my home and evaluate this patient. You come in, they've got an acute abdomen from a leak. And so those are the things that you can, you can have them do, even if it's just they've got a little more incisional pain. So give them that patient care responsibility, and then give them some flexibility. There's ones that have different interests, and, um, and you, can, you can give them some flexibility to go and see a different case um, or do some different things. And if you're not sure if you can give them the flexibility, just call Holly or myself or, or Victoria or somebody who's involved in administrating, in administering this rotation. Um, and, of course, the OR experience is important. Get them in there. Um, if you can have them put a couple stitches, that's nice. Obviously, on orange, it sounds like you, you, it's going to be difficult, but it's okay. Have them, have them uh, help position the patient. You know, have them put the Foley in. Have them get involved. And then uh, ask them questions and let them talk. And, you know, when you first meet them, let them talk about themselves, what they want to do, who they are, what really interests them, um, and get to know them as a person. And then, um, and so... Uh, just, just really be engaged with them. So the main thing isn't so much the knowledge as far as them really learning, but re whereas the enthusiasm and interest in teaching, they'll, they'll pick up on that and then they'll be self-learners. If they're stressed out about where they're supposed to be or whether or not they've made you angry or not, they're not gonna, they're not gonna be in a mindset to learn. But if, if they're enjoying themselves, they're seeing you guys as people they wanna emulate, they're gonna learn and they're gonna, a lot of them are gonna wanna become surgeons. So, um, uh, just, a, just a word about mentorship, because this is what you guys are really doing. This is, we call it as teachers, but the way you're teaching is you're teaching as mentors, and that's because you've been where they've been, and you can bring them on further where they're going to be going, and because you're in a different place than they are, and also because this is a mutual benefit. It's because if you're teaching a resident and you're giving them a, l a little mini lecture on vet management or a post-operative fever or on workup, write-up, or quadrant pain, which is things that you can do in teachable moments, you know, you're, you're actually making yourself a better surgeon because you're going to have to formulate in your mind what are the most important aspects of evaluating those patients, and it becomes second nature. And then, then you have the, the mental capacity to pick up on other nuances that you otherwise wouldn't when you have the unusual case because you're so used to the basics that you've explained to the student. So it is a mutual benefit. So uh, you want to have defined goals for them, and you may want to talk to them. You know, what I want you to do to, during this rotation is I want you to spend enough time in the operating room, but I understand you need to do these other things. I want you to be there, and, and, and you just let me know, and don't, you don't need to worry about it. If you have any questions, it, give them an expectation that they can reach out to you. Give them an expectation that they can talk. A lot of them are, are like, well, I don't know if I should say anything or not. Their next evaluation, they never speak up. Well, did you ever tell them to, to speak up? Maybe they're talking too much. Did you ever say, hey, let's get this, let's let this other student have a... So you got, that's what I'm talking about, expectations and goals as far as how they're a part of the team member. But you've been there before and you're going to teach by example. And just think about where you've been and all the people that have helped you to, to go where you are. In fact, when you look at people that are in poverty, all different types of poverty, be it financial or social or spiritual or opportunity or linguistic poverty, the best way to bring somebody out of poverty is to have somebody who has been there and who helps to educate, educate them out of there. And you guys are perfect for that. You're perfect for bringing the third year medical students along to be a really good intern. And so there's nobody better. Dr. Dr. Moore's not better at that. Uh, Dr. Maxwell's not better at Dr. Murray. None of them can do it the way that you guys can. You guys are also more approachable than we are, right? You're more on the level with them. So that helps. So you need to build trust. And I'm just gonna go through a few qualities that, that can help you to build trust with people around you. You need to have a good balance of both responsibility and service. So a chief, 
A chief may be a good chief that really takes command and control and knows what needs to be done, but a, a, even a better chief is one who, when everybody's busy, he goes and he does the H&P, you know, or he goes and does, he puts the order in, or, or he does the discharge. Uh, and that doesn't mean that that's the chief's main job, but if, if you see that the team needs some help, go ahead and do those things. You know, in other words, sometimes do what they do, serve them. The other way you serve them is by taking the time to teach. And so, um, and the other part of it is allowing some of the younger ones to have some responsibility. So there's got to be a good balance there. And then also strength and humility. And so part of, part of being strong is somebody who feels, and feel, they feel confident in themselves and who they are. They're not intimidated by what someone else is thinking about them. That's a real strength. That's also humility because you realize that you don't have to be the main person. You don't have to be treated a certain way necessarily. It may be good for them to learn to, to treat you with respect if you're the chief. But if, if they're learning about how to navigate the hierarchies of especially surgery, you need to give them a little grace through your hum humility. And that, this is going to help you in all your walks of life when you're interacting with the nurses and understanding the role that they have and appreciating their role. It's going to help you when you're, you're uh, talking to an attending that might be having a short stick or short wick that day and just realize, okay, well, you know, I, I don't have to bow up and just, like, be offended by them. And so that's a real, that's a great strength. Um, help and, and ask for help. You know, there's some residents that think if I ask for help, that means I'm weak. And um, a lot of, I think, in, I think in our culture, people are more apt to help than to ask for help. Again, that's part of that humility. It actually, it actually is a blessing to the other person if you allow them to help them. Now, there's this thing called social capital. And it's something that we all sort of inherently understand. It's kind of like, okay, well, this person's always helping me. I feel a little bit uncomfortable. I feel like I need to sort of reciprocate. And uh, because I feel like that, that, you know, I need to hold up my own den. Well, it goes both ways. So allow somebody to help you out. Don't come in at 3 in the morning Don't, if there's somebody already there. It, be responsible to the patient by communicating to somebody else to help you out because you do need to take care of yourself as well so that you've got the energy to do your job well. So these are all important things. Um, there's something called emotional maturity, and, and um, if anybody's interested in looking at this, um, none of us, I, I'm, I'm, if you look at some of these things that talk a lot about emotional maturity, extremely emotional mature people are, are extremely rare. And if I look at the categories, I might be sort of somewhere in the middle, and this has to do with how you react to or how you respond to difficulties, um, how you, how, how you uh, interact with other people, uh, whether or not that you're able to uh, differentiate yourself from somebody else's problem. A lot of times we tend to take on somebody else's problem. Maybe they're having a bad day. I don't have to have a bad day. You know, I can just go on and realize that maybe I can be a good positive presence for this person. And so that's going to help you with the student. If you've got a student who's, who's anxious, a student who doesn't know what to do, who, who's sort of like stumbling over themselves, there's kind of a pain in the neck because they're not, you know, where you think they should be, you don't need to get emotional about that, right? You can just say, okay, let's just stop and let's think about where this person is and let's, let's try to understand where they are. Let's look and see what's valid about where they are. Okay, you're new. This is your first third-year rotation. I get it. Maybe you're from a different culture. Maybe you've never been in a place like this. It's a different type of rotation. You need to be able to look at them and say, hey, you know, hey, I, I get you. I, I understand why you're, why you're having a hard time. I, I get that. But now let's look and see how you can do better. You don't have to yell at them or, or just be upset or ignore them and withdraw from them. So those are things to think about. Uh, make sure you're listening and you're making good decisions. And then I want to talk a little bit about triangles. Now, triangles are something that occur in everyday life. Everybody is involved in triangles. If my wife and I sit down and we talk about how to better parent my child, that's a triangle. That's a good triangle, hopefully, because hopefully we're, we're out for their best interests. There's also bad triangles. If you're sitting in the lounge and you're talking bad about somebody, making fun of the student, maybe saying, oh, well, did you hear what this person did? Those are not healthy triangles. There's also triangles that have to do with you and your student and the patient. How you interact with the patient is going to affect your relationship with the student. If a student sees you being rude to a patient or just being unkind or dismissive, that's going to affect their relationship not only with how they deal with patients in the future, it actually affects your relationship with that student. And they're, they're not going to see you as somebody they want to emulate. They're also not going to see themselves as really wanting to be here at this place if they're a fourth-year medical student. Those are all triangles. We could talk a lot about, about these things. You don't need to get yourself out of triangles. You just need to make sure that you're, you're being caring in those so that if you're in the operating room and, and you're a chief resident and you're in the orange <laughs> service and you've got 
a scrub tech that is talking bad about one of the other residents and how silly they are. Maybe it's somebody that people think is a little different or whatever. You can, you can actually say just something really general. Say, hey, you know, that person's not here. Uh, let, let's, let's talk about something else, okay? You can actually do that. And you know what's going to happen? They're actually going to respect you by doing that. And so, so the first thing is make sure that if you're, in a, if you're triangulating, if you're talking about somebody else, make sure you're doing it because there's a good reason for it and because you're trying to build that person up, you're trying to figure out how to help that person, or you're talking about something that they did that really inspired you or was really good. But let's, let's not do the other. And I think, I think we've seen our, our attendings and myself, sometimes I, I make that mistake. You know, somebody's sort of laughing about somebody else and I laugh along. Those are the things that we got to quit. That's how, this is how you become a good leader. Because if, if one of the students sees that you treat other people with respect that's not in the room, they're going to feel very comfortable around you. They're going to know that you're somebody who, who really cares about them. So I wanted to spend some time on these things because, honestly, if there's nothing else you take from this lecture, it's about being these kind of people that will make you the best teacher. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to, to do program improvement. And uh, this has to do also with, with uh, systems-based practice. Now, is there anybody that has been upset about the way things are going on around you here in the hospital, whether or not it's... Uh, diff difficult to get something done. Has any everybody ever been upset with a nurse? No, nobody has. Okay, good. Has anybody ever been frustrated because you can't get somebody through the emergency room? Okay. Has anybody been upset because the things they need in the operating room are not there? Okay. So a lot of these things are system problems. Some of them might be personality, but a lot of them is because the nurse is understaffed. A lot of them is because the, the cards aren't right. A lot of them is because We've made policy decisions at the hospital that we've seen in the paper. And so you're going to have those things, and you're going to be rightly angry about them because you care about your patients. In fact, in our surgery throwaway journal, they talked about, about these E, uh, what do we call them when someone gets in trouble on the E, E safes, you know. Everybody's got their E safes. And, and there was a study done in, out in, uh, in Birmingham where they looked at what was causing those. And interestingly, among surgeons, more than anybody else, it's because they were having problems with areas of patient care because they were caring about patient care. And two thirds of the situations were people that had never had one of these Birmingham E safes before. It wasn't like the person that just, just has a short fuse. It's just because, man, they, they were finally fed up with patient care. And so typically the things that we get angry about are actually things that we probably should get angry about. And so the, th the problem that we get into where we are not able to reach our goal, which is better patient care, is because the focus becomes on us if we don't handle it properly. In other words, it's not a problem that we didn't get the patient out of the emergency room on time and therefore they ended up being septic and, and whatever bad happened, which I've got plenty of examples of that. They, that, that loses the focus because all they're going to say, well, Dr. Stanley was really an idiot. You know, did you hear what he did? Did, did you hear what he said? And so then when you try to go and advocate for the change, you're like, you know, this guy's just trying to put up a smoke screen for his own problem. So it's not effective if you don't handle it the right way. So what you've got to do, if you feel an anger coming on and there's a patient care issue, first you've got to stop and you have to say, okay, what is this telling me? All right. So... You, do, you need to let the anger inform you, but not control you, okay? You just need to step back, take a couple of breaths, evaluate the situation, get the patient out of immediate care. You don't need to solve every problem right now. That is not the time to solve the system problem or even to put the nurse in their place. It's just not going to work, okay? But that's what your anger is going to try to tell you to do. So you got to step back. you got to see the big picture, all right? Are you going to die on a molehill? Mole you know, is this is this a big enough issue that you're going to spend all your time trying to get this right? Okay, you've got to think about that, because if you're going to die on every single hill, you're going to die, and then you're not going to be help, much help to anybody. So I think you need that. That's just another thing to be thinking about about how you do that. So you need to pro, you need to think about timing. So, and I still have a problem with this at times, but especially when I first came out. Uh, okay, if I didn't have the things I needed for my patient and they were sitting in the operating room waiting for X amount of time because the card wasn't right or whatever, I might even not direct my comments at anybody. It might be just like, oh, God, I can't believe this is here, it isn't here. You know, I, man, okay, do you know what they hear? The people in the operating room, they hear, they hear, he is not happy with me. Here I came in here and I did my very best. 
And this isn't even an updated card, and it's not my fault. And this guy is, like, upset with me. That's the way they take it. And then how do, how's the wor- rest of your working relationship during the operation? That actually puts your patient at risk probably more than not having that thing or waiting five minutes in the operating room, okay? So if you're going to solve a problem, you've got to think, what is the time and the place to do it? And making comments or yelling or, or trying to problem solve and having them bring in, you know, the head, op- head operating room person right now to make it right, you know, that's not going to help you. When the student sees that kind of thing, they're like going, whoa, hey, do I want to be in the operating room? Man, this is an uncomfortable place. So the students are going to say, you know, is this, is this how we solve problems in medicine? No, it's not. So if you've got a problem... What you do is you keep your calm and you understand what the immediate need for the patient is and you calmly make sure that they're being taken care of. And then what you do is the next day you go and you sit down with Adam or you sit down with Ben Dart or you sit down with somebody who understands the system problems and you say, hey, you know, this was happening in the operating room. Or you sit down with the circulator at the end of the case and say, hey, I know that was really tough for you not having the things we needed and you, you're running all over the place, but I really appreciate that you did that. Let's see what, what, do you th- what happened here. Was it, is it a problem with the card? And then you can talk to the student about how they solve problems in a good way. Because let me tell you, the things that I deal with from time to time on either, you know, in the areas that I happen to be in, the problems that people are having have more to do with, and, the thing, and ben, ben will really tell you this as is the, is the, the chief of surgery. I just hear a little bit at his vice chief, but it's because of these things. It's, and these are the things that students need to really learn about. So, so, so do it later. Don't do it right then. You need to do it in the right place. Uh, you need to close the door. I had a case, I had a situation where somebody uh, was not happy with a scrub tech, that, uh, a scrub person learning to be a first assist who wasn't yet, and, and the, the, the main person in the OR came in and chewed her out in front of everybody in the operating room. I, you know, then she went in and, and wanted to chew her out some more. I said, you know, we can't really talk about this right now. And so what I did is I went and I took her into a back office afterwards and I just said, hey, I understand that it's really frustrating to have somebody who's, you know, kind of out of line in what they're doing, but let me just say that you really affected the way that we are interacting in the room. And so I didn't embarrass her. I didn't yell at her in the operating room. I was firm with her. And we're so, so now she and I are still friends. I can still have a rapport. If I had screamed at her and told her to get the hell out of the room and, and, and tried to teach her the lesson in front of everybody, that would affect my ability to work in the operating room. And she's actually runs the board over at, at Memorial. That would affect the, my ability to take care of patients. So that's just an example. You're going to run into those your entire career, and the students need to see how you do that. So, so you build teamwork and communication. Uh, you, you can do quality improvement projects if it's something like we, we had a lecture on, on getting people up when they're in the ICU, okay? And that was a great chief talk. Probably he was frustrated at some point because he had patients that weren't getting up and he saw a problem. But what did he do? He actually went and made it better here. I never heard of anything about yelling at, at nurses about getting them up. That's, that's an, that, was, that was impressive. Uh, frustration tolerance is something you can work on yourself. You're going to feel frustration. You've got to learn within your soul how do you put up with all the frustration. And sometimes it's just getting a little bit of time, stepping away, thinking about something better, whatever way you do that, that's going to help you be a better teacher and a, a better doctor. So um, you want to encourage the, the, the students, give some enthusiasm, listen about who they are, uh, respect them. That's understanding proper hierarchy. Uh, within within a system and these are things that are hard to navigate especially and we have a very egalitarian culture right now and so students are going to expect um, they're going to it's going to seem a little bit unusual to them because in surgery in particular there are hierarchies and there are good reasons for them okay the chief has got to be the leader you've got an attending you got to show respect uh, you got to do what you're told to do uh, these are things that may actually be somewhat difficult to some of the students uh, because our culture pretty much says that you know, everybody's got the same say as everybody else. So understand that if somebody is not respecting hierarchy, it may be that they just need, they need to have that modeled. And, uh, and so if they see you being respectful uh, to other people, uh, and they'll be modeled. Or you just, just kind of talk to them about, you know, how, how is it that you address uh, other people. Um, and so uh, this is something that I think sometimes when I talk to students, they don't really quite understand very well, believe it or not. 
Um, okay, so um, you also need to be honest and vulnerable. Uh, be honest about your own shortcomings. Uh, that can really help somebody. Tell them a story about a time where you had the same trouble, okay? Talk about somebody who's going to now listen to you as a student. You can say, yeah, when I was a student, you know, this happened to me, you know, and I really made a mistake there, and, you know, but this is how it turned out. That type of vulnerability is going to allow them then to feel comfortable with you, and they're going to also understand that they may not be the best student now, but they're getting there, and you're going to help them get there. So that's important. You need to be patient with them and, and, and use humor. A lot of times we're very serious. I'm a very serious person. I wish I wasn't as serious. There's some people that have a real gift of humor. Um, and and they, you can really help the students just by, you know, having humor with them. Uh, if there's a problem, you know, use a little bit of humor, and sometimes that helps to encourage them. And then take do the teachable moments, the mini lectures. There's some students that are really, really great about that. And... Um, and so I think it seemed to me like, Heath, you did a lot of these, I believe, when you were a, a resident, didn't you? I just remember hearing about that, and I think, I think Heath got some uh, system-wide awards as a teacher. Um, and I think a lot of them is because he showed an interest. He gave them many lectures. They knew that he wanted to teach. And so that's important. I ask them questions wherever you are. Make them be tag along. Hey, come along, because they don't know. They, Should I go with them or not? You know, bring them along. And then if there's a question, say, hey, I, I need you to look this up and, and come back and let me know. I mean, they'll be on their little device as quick as you can say, you know, whatever. And then um, and they'll learn that, and it's really helpful, and that gets them involved. And uh, we already talked about the other one. The other thing is you do need to help teach them the H&P. That, that takes some time, but if, if you're going to go work, out, work up a patient, you may just, you know, this would be an unusual thing to see happen, but if you can show them how to do an H&P, talk to them about how to sit down and look them in the eye, I try to do this in my office with them, but um, show them, show them uh, you know, how to do a good examination, how to do a good physical, uh, how to go through the H&P, especially early on with the third years. Um, this can really help them, how you connect person, how you're efficient, uh, how, how you document, and even talk to them about coding. And then observe them. Have them say, hey, I want you to do this part of the, the I want you to get, get the HPI on this patient, okay? And just, just uh, say, this is my student here, and uh, they're going to ask you a few questions. And observe them and then give them feedback. It's important. The other thing I want to talk a little bit about, are there are cultural differences in the people that come through here, okay? Um, not everybody is from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, there are people who, uh, who grew up in Eastern Europe, okay? There's people who grew up in Latin America. There's people who grew up uh, in the inner city. There's people who grew up in the Northeast or the Midwest or wherever, um, though there in any culture there are these things called unspoken rules okay and like in, in Latin America if, if you're talking to somebody oftentimes they'll talk this close to you okay and that, that's just like what they tend to do well a lot of us were gonna like I just don't feel comfortable around this person it's like they're always in my face or you know there's there's people that come through that maybe they're they have extreme hierarchy in their culture okay and so they're so deferent that they're not going to speak up. And it's like, oh, doctor this or whatever. Okay, that seems really weird to us. It's like, you know, okay, we're good with yes, sir, no, no sir, ma'am, whatever. But, but, you know, this sort of thing where, like, you're going to defer to everything, I mean, you just don't know what you're talking about. Okay, well, maybe it's some cultural rules that they don't understand. And you can, if you can be attentive to that and you can actually sit down and, and talk to them about, what your expectations are and how they can conduct themselves. And yes, it is okay to ask me this question. Or yeah, it is okay to speak up. If you go to Eastern cultures, they don't respect people that are, are, are um, what we would respect, which is the person who is a go-getter, who is always putting their hand up, they're willing to answer the question. I mean, those are the things we're looking for. You know, it's like, you know, they're too reserved. That's what we see. Okay, if, if, you're, if you're from China, they believe that those are the best people. Like, even body language is the people that are, are um, sort of quiet, that, that only says something if they have something that's really important to say, because they see them as being wise and deferent and, and respectful. And those are, so, so you're going to have people come on, on your service that you think, well, this person is just weird. And uh, you take it into account that they may come from a different culture and they need, uh, may need a little bit of acculturation in a, in a nice way. So I've seen that happen a lot of times. Um, so people have differing strengths and uh, appreciate the strengths and be, be understanding of their weaknesses as students. 
and then use respect and discretion. You know, uh, don't don't send them off. And we've said this enough times, but I'm going to say it again. You don't send them off to get food at night. Okay. You don't send them off to do stupid things that are not related to medicine. Okay. You got to show them some respect and discretion on that. Obviously, we all know what the PC taboo things are. Just just stay away from those things. Okay. There's no reason to make somebody feel uncomfortable. Get yourself in trouble. So. If you don't know what those are, I'm happy to talk to you about those. Sometimes people can be overly sensitive. I understand that. And, and you can't just live, uh, you know, being in, in complete fear, but you can show some, some uh, wisdom into that. So um, uh, the, these, are, uh, these are, this is more now, now that I've done the philosophy, um, uh, I'm going to go on to just some things that are more, you know, in ex some examples of, of the basics of, of teaching. So uh, it, it's hard to go somewhere if you don't win it know where you want to go so if you've got somebody you want them to know about this patient just tell them hey I want you to go look up about this patient problem so that you know about it tomorrow okay um, so tell them what they're going to learn today I'm going to teach you about vent management I hope by today you'll at least understand basic whatever it is which now these days I don't even know what they are anymore but um, it said uh, <clears throat> so so just always try to do that um, then uh, let, let's just look here. So resident A says fever is often caused by different factors and different actions are indicated. And resident A says, I'd like you to learn what causes fever and when it needs to be treated. Okay. Who thinks that resident A is the better one? Okay. Who thinks re resident B has done a better job? Yeah. So, so just those are things you can just say. Here we go. Resident A, you're doing a fine job, but you should be a little more aggressive in getting the work done. Are you clear about how to do this procedure? Resident B, thanks for bringing that recent article this morning. It was right on target. Remember the procedure we practiced today? Show me how you would do it again this morning. So which one of those is actually more useful? A or B? Which is B. Okay, right. So these are pretty simple, right? The uh, idea is people don't know what, what in the world does aggressive mean, you know, but they do know, understand what it is to bring an article. So these are just, these are basic things. So some students complain that some residents ha never have time to teach them. Uh, some students praise residents who are always teaching while they work. And so try to make sure that every contact with the student includes a teaching moment. And I've been guilty of this. I'm trying to get the work done. Uh, so just do your best. Resident, I'm too busy to go over this today. Why don't you just go read this afternoon? And B, we're really busy in clinic today at 5 p.m. I'd like you to choose one patient you've seen and present the patient to me. Man, that's incredible, right? Okay, some students end the teaching session by asking, do you understand? And, you know, most people aren't saying, I have no idea what you said. They're going to say, yes, sir, right? So um, a better way is to end asking the student to demonstrate what they understand. So, okay, I just talked about anal pain. Just gave, gave them a lecture for 30 minutes or whatever. We just saw several patients. So I'll say something like, okay, can you tell me now what are the three most causes, common causes of anal pain, right? Then you know whether or not they understood. So... There we go. Uh, you want to give them feedback. Um, and, of course, there's this sort of thing about how your shoes look good, and then, but you're a real idiot and your dress looks nice. Uh, and so, I mean, I think, I think this is all about um, validation, validating that you understand, helping them feel comfortable, that they don't feel criticized, and I think that's a good thing to think about. Uh, you know, um, but I, I, I think... Um, I, I think this is just always mainly is you're really just trying to keep a rapport with the person, letting them know that you're all about this because you care about them and you're wanting them to do a good job. Um, and how you do that, you know, if, if you've got somebody you have a great rapport with, you don't need to necessarily do this so much, right? Uh, you're just giving them some information. But especially somebody, they're first on the thing. One way you validate them, you don't have to talk about their shoes, just ask them how they're doing that morning and show an interest in them and use nice body language, and that'll do the same thing, okay? Um, it makes them less defensive. And then, you know, use some humor and then ask them some more questions. So, uh, so a lot of students say, I keep asking if I was doing okay. Everyone says, sure, just keep doing what you're doing, all right? And so they don't like that. They want to know what they did well, you know? Hey, I really appreciate that you jumped in and helped position the patient. That's great, you know? Hey, man, you really knew about when I ask you the questions about this, I can tell you read. Good job. So that's the sort of things you want to say. 
Um, and so here's resident A. I like the way you often ask me if you can help me. However, you could sharpen your presentations by looking at me in the eye, talking louder. I like the way you really get to know your patients, right? They did the sandwich, all this. Fine, keep it up. All right, unfortunately, I find myself doing this a little too much, right? That's the easy thing. So, um, so criticize the behavior, not the personality. And um, so you don't just say, oh, that person's really shy. You say, you know, this, this person, uh, uh, you know, try to ask one question after the lecture today. You know, just say, if somebody's having a hard time getting out of their shell, you know, you notice that when the chief's up there and they're presenting, um, you know, help them, help along. The intern, you can say, hey, hey, I want you to present this patient for me today, chief, you know, and just say, hey, I'm going to have you uh, do this or, you know, kind of help them like that. And uh, I think um, the, way, the way that you interact about the students, again, don't, don't criticize, don't say, oh, that, that person's a real crazy person or idiot or, you know, give, giving labels like that doesn't really help. Uh, it, instead, understand what it is that you're seeing as a deficit in that person, and that's how you're going to triangulate in a positive way. Well, you know, how's the student doing? The chief says to the intern, yeah, so one of them could say, well, this person, I mean, I can't stay being around them. They're just like always, they're just like always being an idiot, you know, uh, you know, they're lazy. Instead, say, well, you know, I see one area I think they could do is I think they need to probably come in a little bit earlier. I'm going to talk to them about that. Or, you know, uh, it seems that they don't really quite understand how to interact pro appropriately with the nurse. Or I noticed that they came and they, um, you know, did this procedure they learned on their last rotation on this patient without asking us. So I'm going to have to talk to them about that instead of like, man, this person's off the wall. They're crazy. So those are what we're talking about. Um, so which one is better? Are you, uh, you are so disorganized, or your report today didn't follow our standard SOAP format. Try again using the format. Let's review it when, you're, when we're done, okay? Those are things we talk about. In other words, these are, these are traits, all right? And this may be the basis for some of these things, but what you need to do is look at their behavior, and then when you talk to the person, say, you know, why weren't you here today, all right? Maybe it's because they're lazy. Maybe it's because their dog died and they had to, you know, pick them up out of the street or something. So you got to find out what it is. Th these things require a lot of judgment. Are they really incompetent? Are they passive aggressive? Are they defensive? Maybe. Maybe not. You look at their beha behavior. Why don't they volunteer? Maybe they're from a culture that that would be rude. Okay. Why don't they know the subject? Maybe they read the wrong chapter. Who knows? Um, so uh, doesn't care. So the, these these are things that 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 you can. Uh, you can understand and you can see and you can do something about you can you can give them additional reading assignment you know how do you make a person competent that's a lot harder to figure out th to make them competent so don't so these are the things to avoid don't s just say do you understand not giving efficient feedbacks tell telling tell students to change their personality traits rather than their behavior don't tell them don't tell them you need to be more assertive say on rounds I would like for you to raise your hand at least once okay when, when you're in the room and we're going to talk to a patient, I've told you you're the one that, that's going to address them. I want you to go to the front of the line. I want you to be in front of everybody, and I want you to go to their bedside. I want you to touch them, and I want you to ask them a question. Okay, that's, that's the way you tell them that. So get the objectives, um, let them talk, and then uh, take some time. Be enthusiastic. Ask them to demonstrate. Give them feedback. Uh, um, ask them to change a specific behavior. Um, these are all the things that we've been talking about. And one other thing I just want to mention to you guys uh, on this is this is this is a whole new topic is uh, with research is for and this is for the interns that may not know. Uh, some of you will be on research over the, your second, third, and fourth year. But all quality improvement projects must go through the IRB. Okay. So if you're going to do a quality improvement project, just make sure it goes through the all research projects. Uh, go to the SRC and the IRB before they're being done, and then present research ideas to the research to Pat or a member of the department SRC before writing a proposal. And because there's different things you want to put in them, we can give you some good ideas. So I just want you guys to make sure that you know that this is an import, important thing, okay, so that you don't um, run into something that, that uh, you wish you had already done. So, so having said all these things, uh, um, does anybody uh, have any questions about about any of these things we've said? Holly, do you want to say anything? Um, this has come to me a few times recently, so I'm going to touch up on this a little bit. But as
as you all know, we've recently updated all of our lecture curriculums. Uh, the reason behind that is because the number one complaint across every department, doesn't matter where it is in the state, the number one complaint is we are not teaching in accordance to the NBME exam. The problem with that is we don't know what's on those exams. They don't tell us. And another thing is we don't like, we don't get to have any choice in what's being asked. So we went back, we're looking over all the reviews, we're going back to the students and saying, what is on these? Uh, Dr. Miles sat down and took all of the practice exams, took notes during all of it, and we've been working on that to reassess what is actually needed on these exams. Um, so, and I understand it is a lot of lectures, it is. But something that is a little more eye-opening to us is even within the last eight weeks, We've had two students sit in the lecture saying that they've never had a post office section. And then Dr. Stanley discussed that lecture and they came out saying, I didn't realize I've already seen this. It's because they're going into the ORs and they're doing stuff with you guys, but they're not understanding the basis of what those things are. So these lectures are being really helpful in giving them the base information. So when they're walking in, your stuff is a lot more complex than the basis of what they need. So the lectures are helping them get that information. Since we started these lectures, the grades are getting a lot better. We're seeing a lot more understanding of the whole curriculum <coughs> itself. So I know that some of you are frustrated because they are in a lot of lectures and we are working on that. We're trying to do this in one day a week if we can help it. But again, it also kind of reiterates the schedules of the attendants giving these lectures as well as y'all schedules, those of you who are actually teaching it. So we're trying to accommodate everybody, and it is a working process. Um, another thing I'll go ahead and mention real quick, they're trying to change our evaluation process. There's gonna be a new system known as eMedley. I've discussed this with some of you already, and I promise to try to keep you out of it for as long as we can until all the bugs are worked out. But those bugs are currently not worked out. That's the reason I'm collecting paper evaluations because this is the only way that I can actually get feedback from you guys because this new system isn't working on us yet. So at the moment, I'm gonna still need to be collecting them like this so we can do our midterm, so we can do the final grade process. As soon as I find a workaround or this gets fixed, I'll let you guys know the new process, but just know I am gonna try to keep you out of it until I can make it kinked out. Uh, do any of you have any questions regarding their schedules? about these lectures, about their requirements, anything like that. Okay, and now I guess I want to ask you, do you guys have any recommendations for our student rotation? Okay, from time to time we'll hear students say, well, the resident says this about the way that it's done is really bad. But if we don't hear about it, that we can make a, make a change we don't know. Bob? Just like to say, uh, Dan, that was a great talk, great professional development, I think, for on all levels. A lot of good insight and pearls there that I hope people take to heart. Um, as far as what I'm seeing with the rotations, I think everything's pretty good. The, the one thing that I find a little eye-opening, though, is, and I don't know on what level this gets addressed, but students are showing up to the operating room a lot of times not having any idea what the case is about that it doesn't seem like they're assigned anything in advance so they have some time to prepare or even look at the h p sometimes they're just in there you know completely oblivious to anything other than what they're seeing so i think they'll take more away from surgery and have a better understanding of what's going on if they have some time to figure out what the case is going to be in advance and what the diagnosis is and the patient's history Okay, for, for the residents with, with this suggestion about how to, how, what, what's the best way? A lot of times they're coming from a lecture or maybe they don't know. Do you guys have some ways that we can coach them into knowing, one, that they need to do that, number two, how they would actually do that? Because they can't really pull up, they can't really pull up anything on the computer to look at any, any. Uh, they, they don't have access to the patient's chart? I, they, they don't have their own login, do they, Holly? Oh, they do now? Okay. Yeah. For a while they didn't. If the students, I don't know if they're doing this and it just doesn't work great for whatever reason, but if the students could get assigned their cases a day before with the expectation that they need to use whatever references they have to, to read up on it uh, and try and review the H&P. 
it's not all the time that that's a problem, but it's it's fairly frequent. Okay, that we probably need to orient them better to that, and uh, that's going to take some coordination from the residents too, to help them know what cases that they they might be on tomorrow. Um, so that's good input. Anybody else? Olivia. Okay, so that could be a problem. We need to because we we told them that we want them to be available to go to the trauma if they're on orange. Yeah, but but not the rounds. Do you have a, some ideas about how we could do that? Is there should you do we need to choose one day a week on orange where they go do trauma rounds or what? what? Well, does anybody else have feedback on that? Does everybody agree that we need to look at having them round with trauma during their orange rotation? What am I missing? That seems disjointed. I, it does to me, too. Disjointed. Dr. May? Okay, so maybe we get the rounds on. Yeah. The other problem is when some t we're trying to get them the operating room more as well. So, okay, we'll 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 be asking for feedback, more feedback on that, Mr. Hunt. It's a, it's random, and they know that. But they are it be it'll be one of the topics that's covered in the lectures at least. So, it's the, their exam. <clears throat> well, we don't need to go. In, I I don't think the exam is done well. But anyway, it's good. It's a good exercise for them. Right. Yeah, typically it's just either me or me and another uh, and, and different attending, and sometimes we'll have a resident in the room helping to give them. Did, did you want to say something, Dr. Giles? Okay, any, any other feedback? All right, so the reason I went into all this sort of professionalism stuff is because the most, most of the negative feedback we give get is because of lapses in those areas, and, and because it does, I think, make you a better teacher if you can master those areas of, of your... Of your uh, performance. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for your teaching. So before you go, I have a couple of uh, things to address. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks to Dr. Stanley for, for that great talk. This is, I know a lot of you guys have had that exact talk with me, maybe even recently. So um, it's, it's something that's very important. It's going to follow you the rest of your career. And it's, it's honestly one of the more important parts of what we do because a lot of times people don't really care how how well you operate or whatever it's how you treat them and how they feel when they leave the room and so it is it is super important because it's it's a shame to waste a lot of talent um, with not being professional so uh, take these to heart and get his talk and and really uh, make sure that that we're putting these things into practice that's number one okay number two uh, I think we've addressed this already a lot and I appreciate the um, upper levels and chiefs kind of kind of hitting and, and spearheading this but I sent a message out uh, last week about or earlier this week about the um, 
about the work hours. So interns, make sure we're watching when we're getting the hospital. I appreciate you guys being go-getters and getting here early and, and getting everything done. But if you get here at 3 o'clock in the morning, there's no way we can be compliant with hours, especially when you're on the call day. Um, <clears throat> because that means that for, 20, for a 28-hour period, if you stay till 9 o'clock, then you stay well past your, your allotted 28 hours. And it's, it's fairly important that from a checkout and a continuity perspective that we come to conference and then we've got that hour built in there afterwards where you can clean up anything that needs to be taken care of before rounds and before you can get out of here. So especially on the day that you're on call, if you know you're on call that day, try not to at least try not to get here before five that day. And sometimes, like I said, that takes some communication and takes talking to your upper levels and making sure that they know, hey, listen, I'm on call tomorrow. This is the time I got to be there so that I can make sure that I'm compliant because Giles doesn't want any more of these issues. So, um, does that anybody have questions about that or work hours? Okay, so this will get better as time goes on because you're going to get more comfortable with the hospital, more comfortable with your team, more comfortable with the computer system, and you won't feel like you need to get here so early. But um, let's just try to watch that because we do have to be compliant with the hours. Secondly, the uh, baseball game. So as, as most of you know, we're, we're postponing that till next month. It just uh, wasn't possible based on being able to get the seats together because uh, I felt like the whole reason we were going was so that we could go as a team and and all be together and experience uh, experience this as a as a group. And the way it was going to be, it was going to be disjointed. And we were going to have about ten in one spot and five in another and five in another spot. And the seats were going to be over eighty dollars a piece. So we're going to wait and do this next month. I'm going to try to go ahead and look at a time and a date that will work and um, get that out early so we can hopefully get um, a big block of section uh, together. Probably pick a maybe pick a weekend that's not quite so popular as well. Uh, and then let's see the – I see I had one more. Maybe that's all I'm going to be able to cover this morning because I can't remember what it was. Um, but any, anything else anybody else has got issues, concerns? And be sure, be sure you're asking for evaluations. Okay, so think about it every case. You go into a room with Dr. Maxwell, say, Dr. Maxwell, would you mind evaluating me on this case? That's the only way you're going to get meaningful feedback on, on your performance and, and to get it in the system and to get feedback during the cases if you ask for it. So be sure you're asking uh, so that we can make sure we're all getting better. Okay. All right.